Well, uh, thank you everyone uh, for coming uh, to this session of the uh, Glasgow uh, Forum uh, for Scots Law. We're very, very pleased uh, to welcome the uh, SLC contracts team and in particular to welcome uh, Professor Hector McQueen, uh, who is the uh, lead commissioner on the um, project on third party rights and contracts, which forms part of a wider project uh, reviewing the uh, Law of contract in Scotland in light of the DCFR and other international instruments. Yes, we say. So we very much look forward to hearing what you could say. Right. Well, thank you very much, Johnny. It's nice to uh, to to be here. I have got here. We've waited <laughs> <laughs> and all sorts of things down by the River Kelvin, uh, which I've never seen in such state uh, before. Um, uh, but it's it's entirely appropriate to. Uh, uh, offer this in uh, Glasgow because um, really the starting point is of course uh, the great hero uh, of Scots Law and of Glasgow University, uh, James Dalrymple Viscount Stair. Um, and I fear we're probably going to do away with Stair um, <laughs> if uh, this um, uh, particular bit of uh, legislation gets uh, implemented, so, which I'm reasonably hopeful that it will. Um, uh, but one does so with due piety and respect, um, because on the whole, uh, Stair got about 90% right, and it's been, uh, as it were, uh, slowly but steadily eroded by uh, lesser beings following. We don't want to claim that we're in the same bracket as Stair uh, as a lawyer, but I think uh, we are aiming to try and get it at least 95% right. Um, and the, the draft that you see in front of you, which I emphasize very much a draft, um, will, I hope, become the starting point uh, that Stairs institutions have been for uh, several centuries uh, when people are writing about this area of uh, Scots law. Um, I should emphasize that you are the very first people ever seen <laughs> this draft outside the four walls of the commission, more or less. Um, I think has appeared in the parliamentary draftsman's computer uh, 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 and so on. But um, uh, we got to a stage yesterday where we felt that it was possible to share it because we've been an ongoing exercise really as to try to uh, improve it and polish it. Uh, and of course one of the critical things is that it makes sense to people <laughs> when they read it. Um, so. Uh, this is the first test of that uh, possibility, and um, I would very much encourage you to uh, let us have your frank and honest <laughs> uh, comment uh, about it uh, when the time comes for uh, discussion. And Charles Garland, who's the project manager, and Alison Peacock, or at least who's uh, our legal assistant this year, uh, that they will regard as the most important thing because they've heard. I don't know how long I'm going to speak for, but they've heard me on this for quite a while. And uh, so they, they don't really need to listen to that. Uh, and Lauren and who they you see here, uh, had a hand in this project quite a while ago, longer ago than probably either you or I here to uh, remember. Um, but you were the one who started the ball rolling uh, during your time as a legal assistant at uh, the Commission. I mean, uh, the, the, the good work that you uh, did then. So, um, what's the story? Um, well, I, I don't want just to, as it were, expound the bill, so I won't necessarily do that, at least to begin with, but I'll try and explain one or two of the things that uh, troubled us in the um, uh, course of the, uh, the development of the project. And I think the basic message is probably um, the doctrinal analysis is very important. I mean, I don't mean doctrinal analysis in, in a detail sense, but in a very basic sense, about talking about uh, certain, as it were, concepts of law with a far wider application than third party rights, but which we don't always um, get to grips with as thoroughly uh, as we might. The problem seems to me with a common law system, a case law based system, if you want to avoid uh, any sense of pretty little terms, is that the law develops in a very sort of staccato and piecemeal sort of a way and it's very hard, I, I think, for any judge to, as it were, set out 
the entirety of the law. All they are really wanting to do and all they are asked to do by the, the customers is to resolve disputes according to uh, the law. And the result is, I think, that we have in this particular area, we haven't had the sort of basic analysis, fundamental analysis that we should have done. Um, uh, the, the law has ended up in a bit of a mess. But, you know, the, the, the uh, academics can't be exempted either um, because they haven't done, including myself, the sort of fundamental analysis which actually has turned out to be necessary in order to produce an answer that can work. Um, at least we think it can work. You'll probably tell it won't and we'll have to go back to the drawing board. But we'll see what, uh, what you think. Now, the basic story of this is that Stair in the um, 17th century uh, set out in very few uh, sentences, as it were, the, the basic sort of dogma of uh, third party rights and so on. I don't think there was anything particularly exceptional in what he said. Um, he was uh, quite closely, but not entirely, following Grotius um, and uh, the natural law school um, and so on. But I think he did develop some ideas. and. Um, David Seller and I wrote about the history of use by Eaton Tertio Steer called it um, ten years ago or so, and it became quite clear it was a pan-European project. And actually, Steer was really quite original in a sense, but he was basically working with uh, well-known uh, ideas and concepts uh, at, at the time. And in, in, in his treatment, Steer said that if two contracting parties uh, put in what you call an article, what we would call a term, uh, in favour of a third party, then the est use quasis in terms of the right acquired by that third party. And the contract, this was a crucial bit in some ways, as he put it, couldn't be recalled by the parties, it couldn't be uh, revoked. So just putting term in favour of a third party meant that the term at least was irrevocable. Um, now, uh, we'll not go into the tedious detail of how that position was gradually eroded. Um, this jumps straight to the climax of the erosion process, which is Lord Dunedin um, in the Carmichael case in uh, 1920. Now, the facts of that case are extremely interesting. I will not distract myself by talking about them, because they don't really uh, say anything to the point. Um, the fundamental point was that Lord Dunedin thought that Steyr couldn't have meant what he said or seem to say, um, because this meant that uh, part of contracting parties were deprived of the freedom uh, they would normally have to change or even cancel their contracts altogether. Um, and so Dunedin proposed a rewrite of Stair, for which there were antecedents in the 19th century uh, case law. Um, and his rewrite was essentially that um, Having a term in the contract in favour of a third party was not enough by itself to create a third party right. There had to be something more, there had to be something additional to make the term irrevocable. And he ran through various possibilities. Um, delivery was one, uh, that's to say delivery of the document containing the term to the third party. Intimation to the third party, which is clearly drawn from the law of assignation, is really a formal process. Communication, per se, wouldn't necessarily be uh, enough. Um, registration, the sort of very important phenomenon in Scotland of the public registers, if you register the contract, that is a way of making it known to uh, the, 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 the public. Uh, he talked briefly about third party relying on the um, uh, third party right going out and making another transaction using the resources it expects to get from the third party right. And last of all, I mean, the basis on which his case was actually decided was third party knowledge uh, of uh, the, 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 the right. Um, uh, so just when you're thinking that he's being pretty tough and formal uh, with his delivery, his intonation, his registration, he has a moment of weakness in the case and says knowledge can be enough, and in the particular case it was enough. Uh, so the, the third party knowing about the term uh, made all the, the difference. <coughs> so he shifted, and then the famous line, I forget who coined the phrase, that uh, where uh, Stair has said that irrevocability was a consequence of a third party right term on a contract, Lord Eden made it a condition, a requirement 
uh, and a mere term by itself did nothing to, towards creating a third party right. Now, the academic writing on this uh, has been considerable, and it's usually been uh, going along with titles like Stair v. Dunedin, and who is right, and generally speaking, uh, people have said Stair was right, of course, and Dunedin. Um, and I must say, I had thought that uh, when I was appointed as a commissioner to review uh, the Scots law contract and the light of the DCFR, I had hoped there might be a wee opportunity uh, to have a look at uh, JQT, as we called it in Edinburgh at least, um, uh, as part of that uh, exercise. Um, we had to start with the unimplemented reports of the Commission, and the Commission had never got to the stage of reporting on uh, JQT, never mind. Uh, well, it had produced a memorandum in the 1970s on the stair of Eden, and it's sort of vinyl, but it's not actually all that good. That's what I realised as when one uh, looks at it. The key, the trigger that got us going, however, was uh, a blog. I don't know what the Scottish Law Commissioners of the 1970s would have thought of being inspired by blogs, but the law firm Brodie's in Edinburgh um, uh, had a partner called Douglas Matthey who uh, put up a blog saying Scots law stuck in the 17th century. Um, uh, and his basic point was that um, the Scots law on use by Zetum Tertio was uh, not only archaic, um, but actually inflexible, rigid, uh, and not very much use. And a particular example that he used to um, illustrate this was uh, company groups. Um, the situation that he started off with was the company group, uh, which is uh, installing software under a contract with a supplier. Um, there will be one company in the group that is making the contract, but it will be commonly the case that they will want to provide for third party rights for the other members of the company, uh, members of the company uh, group. And he said it's really not possible to do this in Scots law in any sensible fashion, because there is this requirement of irrevocability somewhere or other. And uh, the last thing that we want as uh, commercial advisors is something that is necessarily irrevocable and fixed. Uh, you want to be able to change things, you want to be able to adapt, you want to be able to uh, respond to new conditions and so on. You certainly don't want to be stuck with a contract uh, conferring third party rights because it or has succeeded in uh, third party rights. Um, and he said the Scottish Law Commission must do something about this. So he needed no second invitation uh, on the phone, he came and had a meeting and that's interesting uh, discussion. And of course, the DCFR um, does provide an answer with its uh, provisions on third party rights. So in that sense, the solution seemed easy. I remember <laughs> Lorna was starting work on this in oh, I can't remember, spring of 2012, or whatever it was, 2013. Uh, not as long ago as I thought, but the, um, it's just felt that long. You know, <laughs> so we could do this in six months. That was the confident prediction, because all you have to do is just say, there's a DCFR, um, and, and you know, what possible objection can there be to going down that uh, route? Um, but that was not how we ended up presenting the thing in this uh, discussion paper, because we went into it, we began to sort of uncover um, uh, certain aspects. One of the key ones, to me, this is where I'm starting to get into the um, doctrinal analysis, if you will, was the fact that these company uh, group third party rights um, were very often conceived not just in terms of the existing members of the group, but also future members of the group. And of course, one of the things that happens in commercial practice with company groups is companies within that group come and go. They are formed, dissolved, they're put in for a particular uh, purpose. So it was important. Uh, the future companies uh, should be uh, involved. At the same time, <laughs> the irrevocability point was problematic because if you dissolved the uh, existing companies and you were outside your power to do so, you were revoking uh, their third party right, you could do. That's part of Mr. Matthews' uh, problem. Um, 
And the one thing that was clear to me in that was here was a bit excellent example of something that Stair had said back in the uh, 17th century, where we were allegedly uh, stuck in Mr. Matthews' uh, terms. And one of the points that Stair had made in his account was that you could create a third party right in favour of a person who didn't yet exist. In Stair's time, the obvious sort of example would be a marriage contract um, in favour of the children of, to be born of that marriage uh, over, over time. And there were actually, when you looked around, quite a lot of cases in the uh, intervening sort of 300 years where rights had been created in favour of persons who didn't exist at the time the, 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 the right was made. So it was quite clear that that aspect of third party rights was important. But if you sat down and thought about it, what exactly was it that you were doing when you created a right in favour of someone who didn't yet exist? Um, and that uh, quickly led us on to the point that, of course, you can conceive a right in favour of someone who doesn't exist. Lots of obvious examples. But who has that right uh, at that point in time, prior to the person in question coming into existence? Can there be a right? Uh, and one of the standard bits of uh, analytical jurisprudence, if you were looking at rights from a private law perspective, is a right is something that must have a credit. You can't have a right in private law without there being a credit. And so what that meant, it struck me fairly forcefully, was that when I drew up a third party contract in favour of someone who didn't yet exist, um, there was no right. So, at least at that stage, the contract, at least as far as regards a third party, is freely revocable. There being no one to stop you <laughs> revoking. Okay, so that's an important point. Um, but then let us on to one or two other um, uh, questions, if you like, about this. What exactly is going on? Supposing they don't revoke, uh, but carry on, and then an appropriate third party comes into existence. Well, the right comes into existence. So what's the position been beforehand? And this led us into the concept of suspensive conditions. Um, and for those who are not familiar with this sort of uh, terminology, the basic idea of a suspensive condition is that there is some uncertain event upon which the occurrence, the arising of the right uh, occurs. Um, and so in our particular case, uh, it's not certain whether uh, a child will be born of a marriage or a company be formed. It's only when it does that the right even comes into existence. You can also suspend some conditions where the right comes into existence. There is, for example, an identified creditor, um, but the right is conditional on uh, something else. For example, uh, on uh, my child going to university, uh, I've made a, a deal uh, with someone else, that person provide them with uh, money. So enforceability can be suspended as well as the actual right itself. Okay. So that's, that was sort of step one in the conceptual thinking. But one of the critical points, therefore, one could say to Mr. Matthews, is you've got more freedom than you think when you're creating these future third party rights. You can revoke regardless. And neither Stair had, was halfway there, but he seemed to say that uh, actually there was some sort of right in the non-existent party. Um, but no, uh, Stair, that's not correct. Um, so uh, that's the, the second thing we got on to um, also involves suspensive conditions and also it's sort of opposite, as it were, resolutive conditions quite quickly. First of all, there's a case called Love um, uh, in 1912, and the basic story there uh, is that we have a trade association, a union, I suppose, we probably think of it in, 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 in modern terms, and the members have an agreement between themselves for the formation of their uh, organization. Um, but within that, they provide for the payment of benefits uh, to the dependents of members who become insane. Um, it's, it's quite entertaining, as always, to read uh, the way that people felt quite happy to use words that today <laughs> regard with fear and trembling. Um, uh, and the judges gassing away about it as well in the case that arose. Um, but the point about Mrs. Love was that she was a dependent um, of a member who did indeed 
the common sea in terms of the, the, the contract. She claims her uh, benefit. Um, but the problem with that case, well, she won the case, but it was before the Carmichael case and Laura Dunedin, and lots of people have said since that it must have been wrongly decided. Um, uh, because clearly, in fact, in that case, Mrs. Love's right was irrevocable in some sense because the contract itself contained provision to enable changes to these rules, if you will, that provided for the third party benefits. So they were irrevocable in the sort of Dunedin uh, and Stair uh, language uh, and therefore arguably not. Uh, capable of creating third party rights if you apply the doctrine or the dogma of the mind. However, also, once you got a hold of the suspensive condition idea, you also knew that Mrs. Love had had no right prior to the condition of her husband's insanity uh, occurring. That was an uncertain future event at the time the, the thing made. So, actually, even in that case, there was no question but that. Mrs. Love's right could be revoked until it arose. And thereafter, the only question is whether the um, provisions in the contract, um, uh, which allow the affected <coughs> parties to revoke the right, are capable of being extended so that even when Mrs. Love is entitled to payment, the organization can change the rules, say, no, you're not going to pay. Is that a consequence in that case then of the Carmichael dogma? Uh, well, we didn't think it should be. <laughs> so, uh, that was clearly another nail in the coffin of uh, Carmichael. Um, but love led us to think about resolutive conditions a little bit uh, as well. Um, and then we discovered, or, well, discovered is the wrong word. It's a case that's been in the books for 50 years. Uh, I've cited it myself in um, uh, the Stair Encyclopedia, account of third party rights and contract. But I haven't really applied my mind to it uh, very much. What's the story in Kelly? Well, it's about a father and a son. All we use in these two cases are probably about fathers and sons, and husbands and wives, if you get down to it. Anyway, father and son. And the father has a car can't drive, um, and the son can drive but doesn't have a car. Um, the father takes out an insurance policy with Cornhill Insurance Company, um, uh, and under that insurance policy, uh, third parties who drive the car are covered by the policy so long as they are driving it with the permission of the owner of the car, the insured, the otherwise insured uh, party. Um, now, the story of the case, Kelly against Cornhill Insurance 1964, session came to the House of Lords, I never remember page numbers, um, <laughs> is uh, that, of course, Kelly Sr. dies. Um, Kelly Jr. continues to drive the car after the death um, uh, and has an accident of the kind that's covered by the insurance policy. So there are fourth persons out there who are injured and who are going to sue. Kelly Jr. But Kelly Jr. feels comfortable because he's going to be indemnified by his father, his late father's insurance policy. Now, actually, that case was controversial all the way to the House of Lords, which eventually decided 3-2 in favour of Kelly Jr. and thus gave rise to an effective use quasitum tertio. There was brief mentions of the doctrines of use quasitum tertio uh, in that case, and I think it's perfectly correct to, to, to do so. If you pause and think for a while about um, that position, um, in that contract there was clearly permission required. That's a suspensive condition, permission required. But a resolutive condition is that Daddy withdraws the permission and says, my boy, you're a dangerous driver. Um, I'm not going to let you uh, be on the roads of Scotland with four wheels, at least on the mind. And he clearly can do that. He's perfectly entitled to do it. And he's entitled to do it outside the contract for insurance because it's his car and the contract enables him to give permission to others to drive but it must follow um, from his power of ownership that he can withdraw that permission. So the question is there, does Mr. Kelly Jr., what sort of third party right does he have and should it all fail because it was revocable 
uh, from the beginning, i.e., as soon as Dad gave the permission, Dad could withdraw it. And that's how the Kermite was talking about. In this case, she never go past the first base, um, even though the permission was never actually withdrawn. Well, what the court, of course, fussed about um, was not the permission, but the death. Did the death cancel the permission? Did it cancel the contract of insurance? And on the court of session, that was basically the case went off. And the House of Lords clearly, I think, seeking a just result, shall we say, because it knew there were fourth persons out there injured and Mr. Kelly Jr. couldn't afford to pay the damages. So if the insurers didn't pay it, there was going to be a lot of grief uh, all around. So I think that's the explanation for a majority decision, which is controversial. If you look at Bill McBride's book, um, you'll see that Kelly is there, but Kelly is mostly in the chapter on death and not in the chapter on use of Isaac's interpretation. So it seemed to me it was a very important case. It was post Carmichael, uh, and the court upheld the third party right despite the fact that it was almost enough and could have been revoked uh, at any, any time. So, how to tackle reform? <laughs> That was the, 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 the next thing. Well, what we felt we had to be clear about was the law of conditions. Um, not necessarily spelling out the entire law of conditions, because it has importance in many, many other areas of private law. Um, we had to do enough in our bill to draw attention to it. And more importantly still, we had to get rid of Dunedin's dogma. In We thought Dunedin's dogma must be wrong. Um, uh, it was wrong as a matter of analysis, it was uh, possibly wrong as a matter of legal history, but the wrongness of Dunedin's analysis was greater than the wrongness of Stair's analysis. There is in fact no reason why uh, a contract with an article in favour of a third party, that that article should be one that cannot be recalled. That too is an inflexible uh, outcome. All we wanted was something that we enable third party rights to be created and also um, uh, allow them to be changed, cancelled, revoked quite freely up to a certain point. And that point was probably when the right, we found it difficult to get the right word because so many of the words that we think of like vested and so on have proprietary dimensions and we were quite clear the third party right we're talking about is a personal claim. Um, to uh, some performance or other from one or more of the contracting parties. Uh, so there's a chickiness there about how to, to frame the, the, the thing. But I think informally amongst ourselves we've talked about crystallization of the right, the point at which it becomes a uh, right um, without any conditions attached to it. And despite the fact that there may still be a resolutive condition which could kick in so, um, turning to the, uh, the bill, if I may, at this point, um, I think the first section, we call them sections in the Scottish Parliament, rather than clauses as at Westminster, is just a fairly straightforward um, uh, statement of what we want the basic position uh, to be. First, there's not a party of contract, quite a third party right under it, where the contract contains an undertaking that one or more of the contracting parties will do or not do something for the person's benefit, and at the relevant time it was the intention of the contracting parties that the person should be legally entitled to enforce or otherwise rely on uh, the undertaking. That's the sort of baseline uh, that we are uh, starting from. Um, for those of you who are wondering about otherwise rely, as we did <laughs> in the team, what the uh, Draftsman is trying to do here is cover the sort of third party right, which is sometimes expressed as a negative right, um, a right not to be sued, a right to have liabilities that would otherwise exist restricted or excluded uh, altogether. Um, uh, and in that case, it is quite difficult to talk about enforcing your right. You're really using your right to fend off a claim, and that is. What he says is otherwise rely is intended to cover. So we've accepted that. If you have a look at the English Act, the 1999 Act, you see a rather elaborate phrase about availing yourself as a third party of 
that term of fa your favorite function, which is meant to capture uh, the same basic uh, problem. Um, Subsection 3 tells you that the relevant time when we're looking at the question of is there an undertaking, uh, what, what was the intention of the contracting parties, the relevant time is when the contract is constituted. And again, the draftsman has added in a thing that we hadn't completely thought about, but the parties to a contract who create a third party line later. They add to a contract. Fair enough. Section 2. Um, as it says, elaborates on section one. It's really to try and avoid um, difficult questions that might be uh, raised. So the first one at the moment is a third party who's not in existence at the time. Try to think why it is that so, uh, from stare on, so many people emphasize this non-existence point. I think one of the reasons may be, but I can't find anyone to say this, is uh, a fear of voidness for uncertainty. Um, uh, so it's not the point. The, the, the point is that there is no right, of course, at that moment, as we discussed a short while ago. But presumably the parties generally expect the, the, the thing to occur. Um, this, if one of them was of this, and the other one didn't, because in order to do the revoking that we're talking about, you'd have to have both or all of the contracting parties. If one wants to get out, and he challenges it and says it's too uncertain, uh, I'm not going to have your child. Oh, uh, words to that effect. It's conceivable. So I think it's worth spelling out somewhere in the legislation, as has been done in all the books in 1681, um, third party right to be paid in someone who's not in existence. Then there's a point about the third party having to be identifiable from the contract. You don't have to name a specific third party. It could be as a member of a class or some kind of description. And practice is very important. One of the arenas where we've uh, seen third party rights actively operating is in the North Sea. And the contracts are very much geared along descriptive terms like subcontractors uh, and so on. So it's to recognize that a third party right can be created by simply describing a category of persons who may or may not exist at the time. Um, that is to say, there could be someone who's going to become the subcontractor who's out there doing business already, or it could be a company that doesn't yet exist, but comes into existence. Ah, a great opportunity has arisen, and we will be subcontractors under, under this. So we're again trying to almost here put uh, pointers to the draftsman uh, of contracts. So you can do this, you can do that, and so on. Okay. Um, the undertaking which gives rise to a third party right may be one which is express or implicit. Um, and again, this is to take the point that um, uh, uh, really it's very unusual, in particular, I think, for parties to say in terms, we intend to give these third parties a right. It does happen, but it's not very common. Um, so you sometimes have to look and you say, right, the contract is benefiting a third party, even mentions a third party, but is it giving that third party a right or not? So we're saying the court can imply, infer uh, that intention from uh, the, uh, as it were, surrounding circumstances, the contract itself, um, and so on. And that also makes me, uh, reminds me of a point I think is quite important, which is this word undertaking um, to describe the third party right. Basically, what the English Act does is talk about terror, uh, giving a third party right. And that's been criticized as being too narrow. There's also the conceptualization in, in some quarters of the third party right as a promise uh, to the third party. We wanted to avoid that sort of language for a variety of reasons, but one of them being the possibility to draw in certain bits of the law of promises that we, don't think we should do the third party right. Um, and it's the draftsman who's come up with this word undertaking. And I think it's, it's, it's actually a brilliant word for this, because what it means, I think, is that the judge has to look at the contract as a whole. It's not one term that somehow or other confers a third party right. You look at the contract and you draw out of the totality of the contract the undertaking, which is in favor of the third uh, party. I think that provides us with our 
solution um, to the twin difficulties of, that are created, I think, by talking about terms and by talking about prompts. And it certainly underpins, uh, it is underpinned, importantly, I think, by the implicit uh, bit. The worry that one has is that the English Act um, talks about uh, contracts that purport to benefit a third party uh, do create third party rights unless a contrary intention is apparent uh, or is made clear. And that has led to controversy and increased the rate at which people exclude the English Act to make sure that we have a purported to create the benefit. Our line is very much starting with the intention of the parties, but you can, you don't have to find that intention in some sort of express words, it's implied. But nonetheless, you are limited to the contract. There's no presumption, if you like, of a third party right because the contract benefits a third party. Incidental beneficiaries don't get rights under this scheme, at least what we're trying to do. And then the uh, next bit is where we get in conditions. Um, the undertaking may be one which depends on something happening. Um, whether that thing is certain to happen or not. Now one of the key things about conditions is that conditions are not certain to happen. Um, but what we also wanted to cover uh, was the condition, in inverted commas, which is certain to happen. So, for example, the right becomes enforceable on a particular date, 31st December, or whatever. The right is postponed, it can be enforced before 31st December, but the right exists. So we want to capture these future obligations as well as the conditional obligations. We want to be absolutely clear that parties can do uh, either of these things. Right, so you can see, I hope that we're sort of setting up the pattern that we were, I was trying to explain in the background to when we get there. 2-4 is where, with any luck, we give the quietus to Lord Dunedin in Carmichael. A person may acquire a third party right to enforce or otherwise rely on an undertaking in a contract despite the fact that the undertaking may be cancelled. Okay, the fact that it is possible in any one of the variety of ways this can be set up, whether by the express terms of the contract as in love, by the exercise of entitlements outside the contract by one of the contracting parties as in Kelly, and so on and so forth. Um, there is no requirement, in other words, of irrevocability for the existence of a third party, right? And then the second bit of uh, death to the Linden, there has been no delivery, intimation, or communication of the undertaking to the person. And the point here is that we are saying that there doesn't have to be any of these things for there to be a third party right. It may be, and this is really the point of 2.7, um, there are rules of law which are applicable to the obligation in question that require delivery over and above the mere writing of a term. The delivery is required. Nobody knows how the requirement of delivery of deeds applies in Scots law. Uh, except that it does. <laughs> it's hopeless. I mean, again, if I was given more time at the Commission, that might be an area that I would have a go at. But um, the crucial point here is that it's not necessary to have these, any of these things, either one or all or any. Um, so Section 2.4 is really the heart of it. In terms of reforming the law, this is the bit that is the fundamental change that will brighten and gladden the hearts of commercial practitioners uh, up and down the land. And then we find in the next two uh, to cover exclusion clauses and the like. So uh, we have indemnity, the sort of indemnity that Mr. Kelly Jr. was entitled to, the indemnities are critical in North Sea oil operations, your third party right, sort of thing you rely on. Um, then also, not to hold a person liable in a matter, this is really covering the Himalaya clause, for those of you who are familiar with this sort of area of, of law uh, already, that's the sort of clause which is frequently found in bills of lading and other shipping contracts, whereby the stevedores who unload the ship will not be sued by any of the parties to uh, the shipping contract. And then, of course, in addition, not to enforce or not to enforce in full a person's liability in a matter, and that gets you to exclusion clauses and limitation clauses. The difference between 
between the two is essentially that in the Himalaya Clause and causes of that kind. There is no liability at all. Um, but here, the clause is framed in a way that, in a sense, it accepts that there is a liability. It simply says that certain aspects of that liability are either wiped out in total or uh, restricted in, in some way. And I've already explained section 2. So. Well, that's really, in a sense, all, all we needed to do. You can't have a two section act for three years of work. <laughs> um, so section three is in, um, and this is one in which we're sort of having quite a, 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 a prolonged debate inside the commission. Essentially, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that it's, it's, it's the draftsman's creation. And the thing that's worrying him is the love case and the possibility that somehow or other a Mrs. Love could find herself uh, with her entitlement uh, and somehow or other the contracting parties exercising powers they have under the contract say to her no, or even perhaps to take it back if they've handed it over or partly performed it. In Love's case, she was getting a, an allowance over a year. Okay, so the scenario would be that she gets paid her allowance for six months, and then it's extremely expensive. Or the mental <laughs> is falling, they haven't got resources to do anything, basically. Or stock markets collapse, that's more like so that, so that's what's the worry here, I think. The problem is that we haven't been able to find a way to express this in anything less than this extremely long and difficult sentence. If, when you uh, read it first time, you understood it, <laughs> or to see what we're driving at, um, then congratulations, please let me know. Um, but uh, although the difficulty of it is acknowledged, the, um, uh, there may be a problem. However, we also have sort of in the team the view that we don't need this at all. Um, because at one point we were talking about putting Kelly into some sort of specific provision to say that uh, even when a right existed, and it did in Kelly during the, it could be revoked. As far as I understand the Kelly case, the um, uh, understanding of the House of Lords was that the executors of the late Kelly Senior could have revoked permission uh, as well. Um, so the fact that they could revoke it, it was something that we thought maybe should be guarded against. But the draftsman's persuaded us we don't need to do this. But it's self-evident. Um, and I think it's probably right in that. But I think we're now moving in the direction of trying to persuade the draftsman that Section 3 is self evident as well. But I'm very interested to hear uh, your uh, comments. Section 4 is uh, remarkable. <laughs> um, it was nearly as long as Section 5 and it's one of its earlier uh, sessions. But we suddenly had a flash of insight. Um, what we wanted to do, uh, and essentially this is what 3, 4, and 5 are all about, was to um, say when the third party's right to revoke, which we are you know, allowing, um, uh, despite the fact we're creating third party right, when it stopped, if it existed, when did it stop? So the thing that we thought was more than a possibility was that the contracting parties might contract that their, the right was to be irrevocable. Okay? Um, but the difficult bit was when did that promise that it was irrevocable in the contract come into effect? Um, because it's open to exactly the same difference as I talked about earlier about if there's no creditor, it's useless. It's inert, they can revoke. Um, and we try to develop all sorts of elaborate sort of rules to say when this promise to revoke, not to revoke would become enforceable. And we drew analogies with the law and unilateral promise as stated by Lord Gill in the Vegas Maximum case a couple of years ago. And it was very helpful. But finally, the decision we've come to uh, at this point is simply to say that nothing in this act stops people doing this sort of thing. Um, nothing stops them making what the draftsman of the Lord is calling a promise within the contract that an undertaking will not be modified or cancelled. 
We don't think it's necessary to say that the parties could make such a statement after the contract, outside the contract. Because that's another scenario is, of course, a third party, like young Carmichael, going up to his dad and saying, you know, going to keep it going. Uh, and they say, of course, uh, we fully intend to do that. The law of promises can probably take care of that, as it is, as it's stated by uh, Lord, Lord Gill. Um, so this is the solution we've come up with at the moment. Nothing precludes people doing this. So again, as a pointer to the draftsman, you can do this if you want. You can get out of all this irrevocability issue by simply declaring it irrevocable. Other people will make use of it. You don't know. Finally, reliance. Third party reliance is covered by Section 5. And what we've done is we've made use of the statutory right of interest formula found in the Requirements of Writing Act, adapting it a little bit. We didn't think it was quite right to do as DCFR does and say reliance by the third party um, makes the contract irrevocable. Bear in mind that the whole point of the contract is revocable. Um, when should reliance make it irrevocable? So we found the formula in the Requirements of Writing Act very helpful. And what we also thought with that formula there was that cases that arose under that Act, which are perhaps more likely to occur than under this Act, could be read across and you could sort of pick up uh, from the formula what these rather lengthy words uh, mean. Um, so that's the formula we've gone for. and. Um, it's long and complicated in a sense, um, but one of the remarkable things about the Requirements of Writing Act uh, provisions at the same time is being available to case law. That may mean they're simply too tough, <laughs> but we don't want to be too kind under. Third party reliance, yeah, it's a tricky one. The basic point is the contracting parties have got to know and acquiesce in the third party acting the way it does. Um, it's a kind of personal bar, um, but we don't. The final provision in the section says, well, the law of personal bar uh, screwing things up, vague notions of justice, and so on. So we've excluded it from uh, this. I, I feel I don't feel bad about that. I mean, I'm normally someone who's extremely keen on loopholes to enable justice to be done. Um, but if you look at uh, Elspeth Reed and John Blackie's book on personal bar, there's a chapter called Contract. But actually, the only bit in it that is personal bar and contract is actually the statutory line intervention of so the um, requirements of writing it. Personal bar and contract just don't go on together. We should not say we can't create a contract by conduct. I don't think that's a personal bar. Okay. The rest of it can be trotted through quite quickly and I'll in fact uh, quickly trot past arbitration <laughs> section 8. But I'm very happy to talk about it but it will take a long time. I warn you in advance. Remedies available to third party. There has been a doubt for a hundred and so years, ever since Professor Globe of this university uttered it in his book on contract as to whether the third party could sue for damages at a third party right. Um, and then that wasn't exactly allayed, shall we say, uh, by the one consideration of the question judicially uh, in the late 1980s by Lord Clyde when he was still in the outer house, not promoted. Uh, but he was the external examiner for the contract post <laughs> <laughs> um, But the, um, uh, he said, well, maybe damages could be recovered by the third party, provided it was the intention of the contracting party that should be able to recover damages. So you know, there's a kind of caution there. But again, it seems to us clear in principle that breach of an obligation gives rise to a claim for damages, unless there's some reason not to. And there was no reason. Uh, it was just simply another way of being restricted with third party rights. So we've developed this point. It's a slightly tricky thing to do. Um, you can just, sort of, well, yeah, I suppose you could say third party can recover damages uh, for breach of the obligation. But usually the formula is something along the lines of the third party is to be treated for these purposes as though it were a contracting party. So it has all the remedies that the contracting party would have for breach of the obligation. So that's the idea. But of course, parties can write that out. So, uh, subsection 2, subsection 3, provisional contract. Defenses. Um, no law on this at all. What we're thinking about here is defenses from the contracting parties that the contract is void, voidable, 
um, uh, frustrated, impossible, illegal, and so on and so forth. Um, so what we're saying is that the position here is slightly different from assignation. And I'm sure many of you will recall assignatus utitur iuria Tories, so the assignee, who is a third party, it's the original contract gets no better uh, position than the person the assignor or the student uh, had against the, the other contracting party. It's not quite right for third party rights, however, because the third party is not standing in the shoes of a contracting party. The third party has its own independent right. So what we're saying here, and in this we're following the 99 Act in England, that the defences of the contracting parties are available against the third party provided that they are relevant to the third party right. And again, the Love case provides a neat example because in that case, the agreement which set the whole thing in motion was actually an unenforceable agreement by statute. Um, but the judge, I suppose, oh, I think actually it was Lord Henry, was it? Anyway, <clears throat> you had no trouble in saying that illegality under the legislation about trade unions does not affect uh, Mrs. Love's rights nothing to do with it, so she can still enforce it as an independent right. So the question will always be, does the defense apply to the rights? That is the thinking that lies behind this. So we're following the English there and not um, the, the DCFR. Arbitration, I'll talk about it if anyone's interested, but I'll skip on to renunciation. We don't have any requirement of acceptance by the third party, so we have to have something to say the third party may renounce the right, because otherwise the risk of the third party by being passive will be taken to have the right. Um, prescription was a gap in the Prescription Act of uh, 1973, and that's really it. Okay. And I'll hope that Andreas and John leaving is not a sign of a total shock and honor. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Right. Thank you very much for that. We have lots of questions and we're finished for time, so let's crack on. Who's got the first question? I'll, I'll get to this because I'm more shy, aren't I? And the last four, um, yep. who would the promise be made to? It would be made to the third party. I mean, that, that's actually the issue. Uh, when you, you don't know who the third party is or the third party doesn't exist yeah. and so on. So that's the tricky bit. Um, and I don't think the promise then is any more irrevocable no. uh, than anything else. But exactly the principal reason that I was setting it out the third party right so. Just uh, wondering about just the, the general nature here because you, will, you were saying about the fact that there's no credit or you can't really call it a right in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, maybe this is coming completely left like field, maybe it's, it's crazy talk here. Um, but uh, is it the same element really between the, the, the obligations that are um, created when the two parties are created? Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily that this thing exists as a right uh -huh. until, uh, yep. uh, which is vested in anyone, but rather that both parties to the contract yep. are obliged to make good on the thing, yep. the agreement that they've created. Yep. And then likewise, uh, isn't the use creation tertio itself rather akin to a residential paralysis mm -hmm, mm -hmm. rather than a, a right. So there mm -hmm. is a proprietary aspect to yes, this. And, and even yes. looking through this draft bill, I don't see anything that, that necessarily changes that. Like section four itself there, it's yep. almost like it could be flipped around in a way. You're mm -hmm. saying that there's nothing stopping you yes, from yes, yep. adding something. Yeah. Equally, you should possibly say, well, there's nothing to say that you, you can. So mm -hmm. There's no, no prohibition on yes, yes, so yes. Yes. Of you Well, there are good questions. Um, the, um, uh, I'll, I'll take the second part first, um, which is that we, we are definitely trying to achieve no more than a personal right for the third party. Um, we asked in this discussion paper um, whether there should be uh, any attempt to address issues which have arisen. Um, and to a certain extent, Carmichael was a case of that kind, um, where, um, as it were, there are competing claims to that benefit, mm -hmm. usually a sum of money. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's been argued that some of these cases are indeed really about who owns 
the money? Is it the person who paid for it, <laughs> or is it the person who is the third party uh, beneficiary? And uh, you know, there are also interesting cases about deposit receipts and banks and things of that kind. So, what we the clear presentation response was: don't try to sort that. Out. I mean, we give them a pretty heavy steel in that direction because actually there's an infinite range of situations that arise. So, trying to draft a legislative provision that would cover everything, or even at a level of a general state, is actually quite hard. So, we're just putting this piece of legislation mm -hmm. into the uh, the mix, as it were, and getting rid of some of the the difficulties, um, but there are still questions to be resolved. Um, but they may be capable of being well resolved under the rest of the law, mm -hmm. donation and so on and so forth. Uh, so the first part of the question was really related to that in a sense. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so yeah. when you said to talk about raising corporalities. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Johnny will know more about this than me, and probably Stephen too, and maybe lots of other people around the room. But you know, it is a question of how far you can go with notions of ownership and thinness. Yeah. To what extent is a personal right also something that the predator in that right owns? Um, and uh, having listened to my distinguished colleague in Edinburgh, Professor Gresson, on this subject for a number of years, um, uh, uh, it's not somewhere I would want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, the, the point is, we're, not, we're definitely not precluding mm -hmm. that sort of analysis. Um, and we have not said anywhere, nor, nor I think Charles, we've ever we've talked about it a lot. With parliamentary transfer in terms of personal rights of what we're after. But we have not instructed that phrase to appear anywhere in the, uh, the body of the statute. I was wondering if you'd thrown that possibility of the promise evening and looking for the right on the part. Yeah, yeah, which is the position in England. Um, we haven't ruled it out. Um, we just haven't ruled it in. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's perfectly possible. I mean, I, I remember another sort of aspect of the opening part of your question, which was absolutely correct. Um, uh, that there is a sort of contract here between two parties. Um, and of course, they have mutual rights and duties which they can seek to enforce against each other, which might well include the possibility that. Um, uh, a tries to get B to perform to C. Good. Um, uh, and um, the other sort of side of that coin is that C tries to sue A to get A to make B perform the third party uh, right. Again, we haven't ruled that out. Um, what I think is quite important in that respect is this notion of the undertaking. Um, if you remember uh, your stare, uh, stare says that the contracting parties, one is to perform uh, the debtor, and the other, I think it's TB, dubbed the stipulator, uh, but I think stare just calls them the other, <laughs> uh, can be required to exhibit the contract, which is an interesting sort of notion, i.e., as it's been interpreted, to help the um, uh, third party to realize it's right. Um, so it is possible. But I, I think it depends A on the contract the relationship between the contracting parties and B what exactly is the undertaking. Is the, but we've left it open. But we've not tried to um, uh, make any comment. We I don't know if you were thinking also about the sort of transfer of loss and the black hole kind of case, we are going to look at that in the context of damages. Um, and it may be that this sort of issue will come up there and saying what who can claim what in damages when might be another route into the problem you were averting to. But it, it's a real issue that we decided not to try and the English do have provisions of course, but the critical thing I think about the English Act which makes it not the best model for the Scottish Act is that they were introducing, in effect, an exception to a continuing general rule of privity. You don't have a rule of privity in the strong sense that 
the English law has had for centuries. So we are simply recalibrating the right that already exists and making a few things about it uh, more clear and correcting one fairly major error that's right at the heart of it, that is causing, as it turns out, problems in the real world. Um, and uh, that has to be good. Yeah? Sorry about that. I was actually because I, I look in the under English that there is a provision for double liability. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to compare that there is nothing of such. No, no, no. We haven't considered double liability. Um, uh, part of it, we don't think there's a need to. Um, there is some comment about it in the, in the discussion paper. Um, we just think in terms of general principle, it would be surprising if, I mean, the, 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 for a judge, knowingly to make a contracting party liable twice over, it, one to contracting other contracting party A and for the same loss also to contracting party C, much more likely perhaps to try to apportion uh, claims if such situations arise, you know, i.e. A will recover its own loss and no more, and C will recover its own loss and no more. Um, so I think that's how we expect it to be dealt with. I, I, I think in England, what you have is a sort of working assumption that the, the part that it, it's, it's still a contract between two parties, and that they uh, in, can sue each other and enforce the promise, including the promise to the third party. And therefore, as a result of that approach, the question of double liability does rise far cheaply. But not, I think, if you take the approach that we, in a sense, already have in Scotland. And we've never had an issue of that kind coming before the courts without the courts being able to spot it. No. I wonder if, I'm not sure. And to, just to ask, um, if, like, why, why do you feel like this is to specify what a right is? Like, why not just say that the parties, if they intend to, may confer a right on third party and it mm -hmm. perhaps has no notification. The, the reason I ask is that I think it's because you felt we need to do that that we have this language of enforcement and that other mm -hmm. line. But mm -hmm. that limits the scope, I think, in that it, it's difficult to imagine coverage without a conferral of power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On, the, on third party. Whereas if you just said right, poked, mm -hmm. then the normal track of all principles would sort of mm -hmm. end for you. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Can you give an example? I mean, you, you said power. Well, what, what, what do you mean? Um, so, say, um, uh, um, I mean, you can almost read these rhymes, I suppose, into, mm -hmm. into commitments to future conduct in most cases. So, you, um, are, an option to purchase, um, mm -hmm. the, the power to vary a uh, yeah. price that's payable, and um, uh, an ongoing agreement. Yeah. Um, perhaps um, authority to be conferred on an agent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just trying to sort of. Presumably, you want to come to the full felt. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. And we discuss full felt uh, in here and say rights includes. Uh, you know, what is this? I forgot his sort of language. Immunity. Immunity is powers, 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 powers yeah. and claims. Yeah. So we have already discussed that. Um, as a, a wide concept, what we wanted to do with right was to make it absolutely clear that it was what the parties, the contracting parties, intended to avoid the purporting to benefits, uh, incidental benefits, and so on and so forth. So I think I think we, we feel that the word right covers we get a everything we felt. I, I think yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it would if you didn't have section one or section two, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, which is less than we felt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And which you could argue certainly that um, a lot of the time is simply unhelpfully uh, repeating what's in one one B. Yeah. I, yes. Because well, without 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 subsection two, one one would be permissive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and usually yes. permissive I think, yes, because yes. you don't necessarily want to have to use the language. Yes, 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 yes. But but with subsection two, it makes it yeah 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 one minute. Yeah, 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 and that. I don't think so. Yeah. Would you say that um, 
a power is something you can otherwise rely on. Say I've got a power and I'm going to exercise. Say that otherwise rely is your broad purchase. You invoke a power. Mm -hmm. I, I would prefer invoke to rely on mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting suggestion too. Rely because on the undertaking, yeah. though, mm -hmm. so it's relying on your ability yeah. as per the, mm -hmm. the cost. But, but the reliance to implies, at least as you've used it elsewhere, conduct. Yes. You're learning well, something rather than just changing the, yeah. the juridical universe. Which yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you take that's why I challenged the Johnson on his otherwise reliance, yeah. because um, <laughs> the, we were using a concept of reliance in section 5. Um, and I thought there was room for confusion um, as to who's relying on what um, <laughs> and with what effect, because what you're doing in Section 5 is preventing verification. Mm -hmm. um, in Section 1, and other points where the enforced otherwise rely form is used, you're talking about the right that exists, uh, and in that sense is almost completely irrevocable. So it doesn't need reliance to make it. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a there, there is a difficulty there. Um, I think we thought, am I right, Charles, that we could probably explain it in the explanatory notes, and of course in the report, but the explanatory notes are the things that people read. But it does leave open yeah. perhaps a disturbing possibility that some sheriff somewhere will not quite get it. I'm going off to talk to sheriffs uh, in Inverness on Friday, so I'll find out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting thought. Invoke is an interesting word, yes. Do you invoke an exclusion clause or a non-liability clause? But you do. You mm -hmm. know, it's a clause in your Yes, um, yeah. As I say, I, mean, I don't want to go to avail yourself. Yeah, <laughs> but, but you could just pick out the other Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's something that is already slightly uh, slimmer than it was the first time because it, it used to refer to illegal proceedings. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. The mm -hmm. idea being that uh, I think that the, the draft just saw this um, from almost to a kind of litigated mm -hmm. um, Taking its cue from the fact that it appears entitled to sue in the contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the, the, there was a little bit of a discussion about whether uh -huh. those, that phrase was, uh, was appropriate. Um, so in subsection 2 is a, is a survival of the law, mm, okay. um, as opposed to the um, yeah. right. Okay. But I think, I think the Johnson might well take the point. Otherwise, rely, there may be at least relatively near synonyms uh, which would avoid the possible difficulty Instructions. I don't think you can change the words of section 5 because you take it out an explicit model and uh, start changing the words would start to throw away the benefit of the fact that this is the same formula as in another statute. Sorry, I thought you, you looked like you had a question. <laughs> He's tweeting. <laughs> no, I, I have been tweeting, but I've become engrossed in the scrutiny of the legislation. Um, no, I'm, I'm uh, positive about this, and I'm um, very much like section 2.4, which um, seems to write the wrong in the, the wrong term that the law took in the 19th century. Um, it makes a great deal of sense to me on lots of levels. So. What do you think of section 3? And I, I, I throw that out to yeah. the audience at large. Um, did anyone understand it when they first read it? Mm -hmm. Did you just read the title? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. So maybe, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Some are. laughs> yeah. But is it, is, it, is it stating the obvious? Um, I mean, one of the things no. that we were very keen on in this discussion paper is what we call legislative economy. Mm -hmm. Do no more than you need to, and leave the rest to the existing law and with any luck, the common sense of lawyers and the judiciary. It's not. I, I mean, it, it's, it's it's quite difficult to work out precisely what it means mm -hmm. in terms. I don't think it can be said to be stating the obvious. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, what I was just going to ask about the actual sentence, and this may be a really silly question, but when a legislator 
or a drafter, sorry, is looking at that, is there not a temptation to break up the sub-causes in that? I think there is. Um, so far, he's not been able to achieve it. You, you have <laughs> well, I don't know. So, but I'm not a part of but the, it is quite difficult. And you get a sort of general idea of what uh, the preferred style is from one and two, yeah. and to, mm-hmm. indeed to a certain extent from five, um, uh, even though five is itself quite complicated. But nonetheless, uh, you're just broken up, take a step at a time, and you get the end, <laughs> and you'll be able to apply it to cases by, uh, I mean, it's not so clear. I wonder if you need to be more explicit about your idea of crystallization, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. fundamentally what you want to say is that there are certain triggers for crystallization, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yeah. maybe if you just use the language mm-hmm. and set out the triggers for crystallization, mm-hmm. you can put this up in, in subsection, in section 5, mm-hmm. then that, that would clarify things. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it, it's useful to distinguish crystallization from vesting. Uh-huh. Because yes. the right vest, and vesting is not the, like, it's not a, a personal right vest. Yes, it's like a yeah. uh, beneficiary under will. Yeah, yeah, right yeah, yeah. But you mean something different. Yes. I, I don't think you put crystallization into a statute either. <laughs> Why not? Um, you think it would, it's possible? I mean, it, it, the trouble is, so many of these words carry connotations for me from other bits of the law. You know, I'm like custom crystallization, for example, when we're talking about floating yeah, charges, absolutely. vesting, when we're talking about wills and trusts and so on. Or, so forth. Um, but you, you could just say the, the, the right becomes uh, or ceases to be subject to modification by the party mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. the occurrence of these events. Mm-hmm. 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 Write that down, Charles. I mean, that would be that you're heading for. Section 5 really yeah. is just trying to get substance of what you mean. Mm-hmm. 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 But it's, I, mm-hmm. it would be useful if you could come up with a term for it. So I think it would be yes. outside of third party rights, it's just a useful idea. Yes, 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 yeah. But that, you know, it's, it's not the case that every right is conditional in this technical sense. And we want to get mm-hmm. that level of clarity about what we mean. And there could be lots of terms, um, you know, which set down things that are necessary for uh, a right to crystallize, which aren't in any sense conditions. So, yes, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky yeah. one. But, uh, I quite like the notion of uh, Section 3 beginning with the right um, and ceasing uh, to be modifiable or alterable when something uh, indicates you know, that this is the beginning of a body of sections 3, 4, 5 yeah. which are aimed at that particular time. Any other questions, comments? Uh, well, in that case, it involves <laughs> me to thank everyone for coming in, particularly to thank those who came through from Edinburgh, from the Commission on the University. Um, we're delighted to have you. Um, should you wish to come back, <laughs> then um, you can uh, find our, our program uh, on, on the School of Law uh, blog page. But our, our next meeting will be here on the 9th of December, and it will be a round table discussion on land reform. Uh, <laughs> further details. You've got a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, you're very welcome. Well, thank you for your appreciation for extra news. Take it out of house for those times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, doesn't seem to be yet filled with a dread disease. Not <laughs> comprehensible. It's beautiful. Great. Thank you. Our tendency, if I don't mean to, 
I wouldn't be it's, it's repaired just to make it. Refreshment. So anyone who wishes to join us on that is more than welcome to do so.